There are four things that I want you to understand about long-term assets, what they are, their categories, how to handle their declining value, and how they're capitalized. Long-term assets are resources we expect to provide benefit for more than a year. We might get value out of them over the next year, but they will provide most of their value beyond the coming year. Long-term assets are divided into two main categories, tangible and intangible. Long-term tangible assets refer to property, plant, and equipment, but they can also refer to natural resources like a plot of timber or a gold mine. Intangible long-term assets refer to things like patents, trademarks, copyrights, and goodwill. We could hold up other long-term assets such as investments, but for most companies, long-term assets are either PP&E, property, plant, and equipment, or intangibles. Each type of asset has its value reduced across time to match the theoretical declining market value as the asset ages and gets closer to expiration. We see that property, plant, and equipment depreciate while natural resources deplete and intangible assets are amortized. In straight-line depreciation, the value of the asset declines by the same amount each year. Let's say, for example, you bought a new vehicle for $60,000. The vehicle has a useful life of five years. We divide the $60,000 by 60 months for five years, making our depreciation expense $1,000 per month for five years. The one thing that we do not depreciate, however, is land. However, if the piece of land contains a building, then we have to split the value of the land and the value of the building so we can appropriately depreciate the building. Depletion and amortization work similarly for their respective assets. Straight line depreciation is not the only way to depreciate an asset, but it is the most common. Accelerated depreciation refers to a model that attempts to take more depreciation expense earlier in the life of the asset to reflect the greater change in value that occurs when the asset is newer. You know, when you drive off the lot in your new car, it depreciates faster in that exact moment than you know, any other period in the life of the car. So it's still time-based, but recognizing the expense earlier also means less taxable income initially, which as we will see in a couple of weeks, can really be advantageous for cash flows. The other method listed here is units of production, which simply uses a non-temporal activity such as how many miles you've driven or how many units were produced as the basis for depreciation calculations. In order to calculate depreciation, we need to know the value of the asset. We capitalize, meaning that we record the value on the balance sheet, 100% of the cost of getting the asset into working condition, including inbound shipping, setup work, and taxes. However, we cannot capitalize the operating cost of the asset once it's put into production. In our vehicle example, when we buy it, imagine that we pay cash for it. The journal entry to record the purchase would then be a debit to PP&E for $60,000 and a credit to cash for the same amount. As each month goes by, we would depreciate the vehicle by $1,000 by crediting the accumulated depreciation account, which is a contra account to PP&E, and debiting the depreciation expense account. This way, the gross value of $60,000 never changes, but the accumulated depreciation grows each month by the depreciation expense, so our net PP&E, which starts at $60,000, becomes $59,000 after the first month, $58,000 after the second month, and finally, at the end of the 60th month, the gross value will still be $60,000, and the accumulated depreciation will now be $60,000, leaving the net book value at zero. When we dispose of the asset, we will have to compare any revenue, if there is any, to the book value. For example, if we sell it after 50 months for $15,000, when the book value is still $10,000, we will have a taxable gain of $5,000. Finally, we need to capitalize some long-term leases, specifically capital leases. Historically, companies would lease facilities creating a long-term liability based on the contract of the lease, but because they didn't own the asset and expense the rent each month, the liability would remain off balance sheet, meaning nowhere in the company's financial statements would that contract show up. In the last few years, an accounting rule has changed to now include capital leases. These leases provide the lessee the opportunity to purchase the facility at a discounted price at the end of the lease period, so it makes it kind of like rent to own. Such leases now have to be capitalized as if the company had purchased the asset and financed the liability with debt, but that's a little bit more technical than we need to go into right here. As you can see, Long-term assets can be more complicated than just the traditional PP&E that most people are used to.